Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast, where we talk with early stage entrepreneurs to understand what information they use to inform product roadmap, strategy, and market differentiation. Welcome to the Startup Competitors Podcast. Today, we're sitting down with Max Yoder with Lesson Lee. Max, welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Uh, tell us about Lesson Lee. What do you guys do? Yeah, we make training software, uh, and we make training software for two specific teams, sales teams and customer service teams uh, uh, in general. Uh, we focus on those teams. We call them customer-facing teams, so frontline teams. Uh, they have this constant challenge of maintaining this high bar of quality while the processes and the tools around them are constantly in flux. So training and retraining becomes this need week over week, month over month. Uh, so we sell into those specific teams. Uh, we try to find the people who need us the most in a business and that's them. And that's different because a lot of training software sells to HR. And you know, it's not that we don't ever work with HR. It's that that's not who we, we sell to. That's not who we target. Uh, and we're not trying to do the horizontal compliance focused or manager training focused uh, learning management system. We call ourselves team training software, specifically focused on teams. And we believe those two things, and we've seen those two things can coexist in a business. You can have that horizontal learning management system that HR owns, but the sales team needs a specific training software that's purpose built for them. Same with customer service teams. So we're basically opening that up to evolving the space to say it's one software doesn't fit all. So make that tangible for me in terms of like how I actually interact with your product. If I'm a manager of a sales team and I bring in lesson lead a help train my team or to help us share tips and things that we're learning from the market real time. What does it actually look like? What yeah, do I do? I appreciate you asking that. So lesson in practicality uh, would work like this. Let's say you're moving from one lead distribution model to a different one. So account executives used to get leads a certain way. Now they get leads a new way. Uh, you would write a quick lesson uh, around how leads are going to be distributed. You'd make sure you put uh, prompts in that question to, to seek people's understanding, not necessarily quiz questions, but it's like, do you get this? And throughout the entire lesson, we have a, 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 an ask button that's going to have it's going to give the accounting executive the ability to ask questions as they go. So this isn't meant to be like I'm not quizzing you. I'm telling you. I'm, I'm trying to educate you, and I'm hoping that you understand. And if you don't, I'm hoping that you tell yeah. me. So when they're done with that lesson, they're going to understand the new lead distribution mechanism. If there's any process they need to do, like maybe they need to click a few and uh, do a new workflow on a piece of software, you can teach them the new workflow, and then you can ask them to show you how they do it. Uh, and that's the practice portion of Lessonly. So first you learn, then you practice, and then ideally that drives improved performance. So the learning happens with, I'm going to make sure you know a new thing. Then I'm going to help you practice that new thing. You might pop on your webcam, practice your new pitch. You might uh, turn on uh, the screen recording software and record y yourself doing an interaction. You might practice how you respond to an email. We've emulated email environments. We've emulated chat environments. So we can put you in a specific situation and say, how would you do this? And you can give it a shot. And across different criteria, we can say, good job, not a good job. And you know that criteria before you go in. And when we say not a good job, it's you know meant to say, here's a place you can improve. Here's why we think you can improve. But the really cool thing about learning plus practicing is the practice content gives you new learning content. When somebody does a great job practicing, you might go through and do an excellent job pitching lessonly on our sales team. We can then put that back in the learning and say, here's a great example of a great pitch uh, by somebody who works here and does it well. When somebody can see what good looks like and they know that it's attainable because one of their colleagues did it, you know, this is not a wizard who did this. This is somebody who's sitting right next to them. They know they can do it too. So by, by learning and practicing, you build confidence, you build competence, uh, and your performance improves. Solid. Give me current status of Lessonly. Where are you guys at in the journey? Uh, you talk about key stats, vanity metrics, whatever makes sense to help somebody who's listening understand where you guys are in this process. Yeah, I'll take you through the things that I think people generally ask when they when they want to understand where the business is at. They usually ask, how big is the team? So we have 100 people on the team today, the majority of which are in Indianapolis, uh, 94 or so are in Indianapolis. A lot of people ask, have you ever raised money? We have raised money. We've raised about $14 million. I don't consider that that interesting. I think you can raise a bunch of money and have it mean nothing. You can yeah. raise a little bit of money and have it mean nothing. You raise no money and have it mean uh, everything. Well, uh, 14 million is a pretty good number for Indianapolis. So that's, uh, that is impressive. Yeah, we've been, uh, that, to, that to us is basically, uh, that is the, the spot where we want to be in so far as not like being, you know, raising more than anybody else. We want to raise the right amount. Yeah. And I think everybody wants to raise the right amount, but it's easy to actually raise more than you need. And it's easy to raise less than you need. And so far we've been really happy being really capital efficient and remaining the growth with growth. So we still have a lot of that 14 million. That was always part of the plan. And we intend to always have some of that 14 million. And then, so we got hundred people, $14 million in funding to 550 customers uh, across the globe. 
uh, big, big, big companies that you wear on your clothes every day, big, big, big companies that power the engines that you that take you from place to place in airplanes, uh, down to small companies like us, who you may or may not have heard of, but that matter quite a lot. Uh, you know, every one of them matters. And but they just are they vary in all sizes. The cool thing about our business is we can sell to a 50 person sales team or a 5000 person sales team. And the fundamentals of what they need are the same. The 5000 person sales team might need different security documents. Uh, they might need uh, us to make things uh, scale at different sizes. You know, our application yeah. need to be able to support 100,000 people at a time, that sort of thing that a 50 person company would never need. Uh, they might need user management stuff. But on the whole, all of those things provide value, not just for the 5,000 person company, but also the 50 person company. When we make a security update for the 5,000 person company, it benefits 50, 50 person company. We make user management easier, it benefits 50 person company. So that's kind of cool. You know, they're different sizes, but they have the same needs and we can work on both of them without having to feel like we're building two different products. I'm going to go off script here a little bit because I don't think I've ever asked you this before. Is lesson like, so I know what lesson lead today is and you just described that. Has that always been what it is? Like how, you know, great question. how close is what the, the company you're running today to the original vision when you first started out? Yeah. So as soon as it was decided that business to business is going to be the approach, we're going to sell training software to companies. We, two of the three things that we do today, we, we, we said we were going to do three things. Now we do two. But it's a big difference when you drop that one. Uh, the first was basically just HR onboarding. So it's not that we don't do that with customers. They just have to really like our philosophy if they're going to come on the HR side. You know, it's like some HR philosophies don't fit us and some do. Yeah. But we used to say we were going to do uh, onboarding, uh, customer service training, and sales enablement. We, what we realized over time is if you want to build another cornerstone on demand, which is like the big gorilla in the learning management system space, uh, you have to go wide and do a whole suite of uh, HR focused tools. We want to build training software really, really well. So we want to stay focused on training software. We think a lot of people underserve, they kind of do it okay. And then they start doing other things and it always just stays okay. We want to keep a focus on training software. So what we found out is by selling to those three different constituencies, um, two of them have a lot of common threads. Like I said, their frontline teams are customer facing. Yeah. And those common threads uh, create a space for us to really go deep and provide a ton of value. And uh, you can't do both uh, if you want to do any one of them well. You know, you can't serve the human resources needs that are much broader and serve the frontline team's needs. So we had to pick. And what we saw was there's 400 people who have already done the HR one. And there's very few people who have done what we're doing now. And we love to be able to evangelize that. You, I know that you've learned over time and inertia has taught us that there's one training software in a company, but think about HRIS systems and CRMs. They're fundamentally the exact same thing. They're just built for two different constituencies in the company. One's built for HR to manage people data. One's built for sales to manage salesperson data. Right. They do the same dang thing, but you would never go and buy an HRIS for, to use for your CRM and you never go buy a, a, a CRM to use your HR, HRIS. That's what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're differentiating similar fundamentals, but when it comes to the actual value, that's where the sprawl starts to happen and you can't try to do both at the same time. So in the space that you're in, which is sales and customer service enablement and training, yep. who do you think of classically as competitors in that space? You can name specific companies. You can talk about alternatives that maybe aren't software that teams are using today that you're trying to sell against, whatever makes sense for you. But when you think of competitors to Lessonly, what comes to mind? Yeah. So the our number one competitor, it's funny what I'm seeing here, you know, six years in, that's another thing that I probably should mention. We're six years in now as kind of the thing that, that shows you where we're at. Took a real, it took a real long time to get here, but it's been real fun. Six years in, uh, six years ago, we were competing with the same biggest thing that we're still competing with today, which is inertia. Uh, people just status quo. What we have to do is lower the effort that is required to create great training programs and put a real spotlight on the value if we want people to adopt it. And we've continuously, every time we release new software, every time we add a new component to our to our solution, whether that's services, whether that's templates for lessons, we're reducing effort to increase value. We have to keep doing that for a very long time so we can get the people who are, they want training to work without putting in much work. And today, training has an upfront investment for it to, to, to start moving. Right. I don't blame those people who want to do less and get more. And I, it's a good mission for us to serve them too. And right now, we're serving the people who are willing to put in that elbow grease to get the value. And they start seeing that value very quickly once they do. But I want to make the hurdle so small, you didn't even know you walked over it. And that's how we're going to be able to get all the companies that need training to be using Lessonly. And we have a we have a mission that says we want to help people do better work. So we should try to help the most people do better work. 
if we keep the effort high and we keep the value where it is today, we're not going to be able to do that at the rate we want to. So we have to reduce effort and increase value. And that's how we're going to beat inertia. Uh, but then when a competitor comes in the door, traditionally, uh, we would have competed against document creation software like Google Docs, Word Docs, PowerPoint, and uh, Google uh, presentation software. You know, anything that traditionally has been document management or Word documents, that kind of stuff. We, we can beat against that because that's where people should tend to put their tribal knowledge right. if they're putting it anywhere. And we get them over the hurdle to say, hey, you need to be able to assign this stuff. You need to make sure it's consistently delivered. You need to make sure you can see who's seen it and who hasn't. Uh, you need to get, make it guided because uh, a Dropbox folder is not guided and a bunch of Google Docs are not guided. And you need to make it interactive, not from a, an animation standpoint, but from if somebody's not getting what they need, how they tell you? Uh, and how do you how do you manage that at scale? There's a lot of things that those softwares can do that overlap with what we do, but there's some nuance that makes a difference. And they don't have any intention of being training. So, but that's where people generally are starting. They're either starting with nothing or they have some Google Docs and some presentations. And then there's other softwares now that are in the sales enablement training space or the customer service training space. And that's the cool thing. Six years ago, we didn't really even know we were going to be there. You start to see people, ask, they stop asking, well, how's this different than Google? Why should I just do this in Google Docs? Or why should I do this at all? And they start asking, oh, so you're like that other person that I've seen before or that other company that I've seen before. And that's good for us. You know, everybody's evangelizing the same thing. That makes me increasingly confident they were in a space that matters. And now our job is just to make sure that our effort is less and our value is more consistent. And that we have a bunch of customers out there who sing the praises of us. So we bring more in. Right. When you think about product roadmap, so fast forward in your head to less than two years from now, yep. which hopefully you don't have something to find that far out already. If you do, that's awesome. But when you think two years out into the future, how much of that is going to be driven from maybe what the market is doing and what your competitors are doing versus what you see from your customers' needs and what they're asking for? Do you, how do you guys manage that balance? And, and do you have a formal process for how you look at that? Yeah, I think ultimately anything the market is doing is a reflection of customer needs. Sometimes they're hypothetical and they're guessing. Sometimes they're validated. Right. But if I see something happen in the market, whether it's an analogous product uh, that don't, doesn't compete with us, but maybe has some overlapping fundamental ideas, that's a great place for me to go look and say, that's really smart. And those people are focused on a completely different area. Like I think about Pluralsight. Pluralsight is basically lessonly, but for engineers and developers uh, with maybe less manual content creation and more built-in library of video training. So Pluralsight is going to come in and say, hey, you're an engineering team. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Engineer, what do you want to learn? Oh, we've got that. We can educate you on Ruby on Rails. We can educate you on uh, JavaScript, jQuery, anything you want to learn. They are training focused on a specific team, just like we're training focused on a specific team. There's a lot of great stuff we can learn over there because they don't they don't care about our space and we don't care about their space. But we're both mar beating the same drum of, right. hey, the team needs specific training for a different specific, you know, specific teams need specific training softwares. I can learn a lot from them. I can learn a lot from our direct competitors. I can learn a lot from a book about how people used to use looms in the past and the things that they did that were really smart that we can apply now. Like there's a lot of good ideas and they're everywhere and they are across time and space, you know? So I'm always just looking for analogies uh, and uh, I will want the team to always be looking for analogies. And that's where we build a roadmap. But fundamentally, we focus on that decreasing effort at increasing value, which is so dang simple, but that's kind of the, that's the core of everything, right? From that, we build things like the better work method. That is the the most tangible way that you can see our future. Better Work Method is a six-step process for building a great training program. It starts with assessing what, what the needs are of the team, planning how you're going to deliver on those needs. Once you define, once you decide what part of that assessment do you want to pick out and say, we're going to tackle that issue. We're going to tackle that need. Then you plan it. You say, hey, is this going to be Mike and I doing this together? And how many things are we going to need to build? How many practice scenarios are going to be involved? Are we going to do anything in the classroom? Are we going to do it all on demand? Uh, you build that content. And then you learn, you practice and perform, and you repeat it again. Then you assess how do we do, and you start over again. Assess, plan, build, learn, practice, perform. That six-step method influences all of our future product decisions. How do we make assessing? Uh, how do we reduce and compress the time to value for assessing? How do we do some, reduce, compress the time to value for planning, building? You get the idea. Let's yeah. let's let's make the let's compress time in each one of those quadrants by adding new features uh, and adding new services that make that possible. Have you guys ever removed features from Lessonly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. When do you guys make that call? Yeah, we have a really... There's a lot of people who deserve credit anytime we make that call. And I say, and I, I come at the posture of that deserves credit because it's always easier not to do something than to do it. And it, I think it requires a bit of guts and fortitude to yep. say, we're not doing that anymore. 
you know, sometimes we remove features because we frankly didn't build them well enough in the first place. And we weren't convicted later on that we should invest more time. And that just means you pick up the phone and you call anybody who was counting on it. And ideally, not many people were because that's why we right. put the minimal effort in uh, and you tell them why. And if you don't do that and they hit you up and say, hey, why didn't we get any notice here? Then you apologize and you tell them why. You know, that's going to happen. It's not a, something we've done a ton of, but when it does happen, it's usually a reflection of we thought we wanted to go here. We decided we didn't want to go here. Or maybe we integrated with something that at, at the time meant, made a lot of sense. We used to integrate with like a, a GIF search engine. And that was really cool. And I think it probably still provide value. But what we also found out is people find just sometimes be distracting in training. So, yeah. you know, use them more minimally. And we were kind of encouraging people to use them maximally. And they kind of lost their luster over time. You know, people kind of got it. You know, right. the, the novelty wore off. When that API broke, we had other things to do. And we didn't ever reprioritize building it. So we pulled it out. And there's still people who are like, hey, I thought that was really cool. And I totally get it. But there's other things that are also really cool that reduce effort and increase value in different ways. And we're going to focus on those. Right. Fantastic. When you look at the landscape of companies that you could potentially partner with, right? So I'm, I, I know a little bit more about sales than I know about customer support. So I'm going to focus yeah, sure, on that. Sure. So I think of Lessonly integrated into the CRM potentially that I'm working on so for, I'm thinking maybe just in time training needs or you you know, things like that, whether it's with the tool or with how you manage an account or an issue that might kick up. How do you guys think of just the landscape that you're in, maybe not from a competition perspective, but a cooperation perspective where like, you know, us and them together can more aggressively go after this market or have a distinguishing value prop that allow us to compete against the big boys in the space or whatever the case may be. Yeah. How, how much do you guys talk about that as a company? Yeah, quite a bit, especially now that we, with the advent of the better work method, we call it the better work method because our mission is to help people do better work. And we believe when people do better work, they live better lives. Uh, And I don't necessarily mean that somebody walks out of work uh, having a good day and that has an impact that carries on for the next 10 years, but it certainly has an impact that carries on that day. And they might take it in with them the next day and they bring it to their families and their friends. And there's that extra levity and that extra confidence that walks with you outside of work. So we think it's really cool. Helping people do better work would be good enough, but we know that when you do better work, you also have a better life experience. We've all known what it feels like to not be good at our jobs and to not love that going home. You don't just turn that off. Uh, you don't turn it off your life off at work and you don't turn your work off uh, when, when, when you're living outside of work. So that's our mission. We call the better work method, the better work method because of that. And when we, do, when we figured out those six steps, which is important, I think for me to mention, we didn't come out of the gate with those. It's probably, it's been in the past year that we've uh, really dialed those in. So one, I, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit. That is sure. hugely aspirational. As you were talking about the better work method, how it impacts people's lives. It, it's a, you know, for me as a leader, it's one of the things that I suck at is how do you how, like the why, the why, yeah, why sure. like, why are you doing this? How, like, how does the work you're doing as an employee in this firm, you know, impact people's lives in a great way. I'm totally not good at that. In a couple, I know how that feels. A couple of podcasts ago, I can't remember which number it is. Uh, we had uh, Dora Lutz yep. uh, on the podcast and uh, she's got a new book coming out about aspirational businesses. And uh, she talks a lot about aspirational leaders and leadership. And dude, you were just like spot on with what she talked about in that podcast in terms of like, you know, defining the why and making it matter and, and stuff like that. So Thank one, you. I just want to say like, dude, you're on it. Like keep doing that. That's amazing. I'm sure you've had some reps, but it's, uh, it's, you, you did that perfectly. So Thank you. where did that come from? Talk a little bit about, go back in time, like when you guys were developing that, was that something that you clearly knew as a team that you guys needed to develop that and get more crisp about it and yeah. make it tangible? Was it more of like, how do we position ourselves in the market and you backed into it? How did you guys get there? Yeah, I really appreciate you asking that because I think it's so important for if anybody heard that and felt similar to you of like, hey, that was crisp and clear to understand how long it took to get there. And uh, the many years that I was completely unsure of what the why was and continue, like uh, Mitch Causey, a third person who joined the team as our director of marketing, still a director of marketing today, his first day on the job, he's like, all right, so what's our why? Because I'm going to build all the marketing around that. And I didn't know. I hadn't seen the Simon Sinek video. And when I saw the Simon Sinek video, I didn't feel any closer. I got it. Right. But I, I, I felt... I was at a different stage in my life then. I think probably a, I'm always going to be insecure, but I was at much different kind of insecure then. And really around not wanting to be a phony. And I'm still really conscious and never wanted to be a phony. You know, like don't do something that is not genuine to you. And if you do something that's not genuine to you, you know, just be like, that wasn't genuine to me. And I wish I wouldn't have done it. Coming up with a why uh, and kind of saying, hey, we matter straight out of the gate. I didn't have the confidence to do that or I didn't believe that I knew why we mattered. So Mitch was comfortable enough rolling with the punches for a year and a half, two years, 
while we danced around it, while we guessed. And I was like, Mitch, I, I, I don't want to come to this disingenuously because I think our customers will tell us. Uh, I think our experiences will tell us. And once we get there, we'll know it. And he was, you know, comfortable with that and, and, and so encouraging with that. And we ultimately figured out uh, the, the the better work uh, side of things by just listening to why, why would people come to us and be elated? What were they saying when they were elated? What were the learners who were taking our software saying about why they were glad they did it? And it ultimately boiled down to, I'm better at my job now. And we know what it feels like to be better at our jobs. Or, hey, I just don't have to guess anymore. And it's nice to not have to guess. It's cognitive load to guess all day. when they have so much willpower, right? Yeah. Uh, don't make people guess if they don't have to guess. So... It took time and it feels crisp now, but uh, that'd be, be a false indication that it always did. You know, don't, don't right, believe that it always yeah, did. Yeah. And I hope that helps. It was really slow, steady, uh, and I wouldn't rush it. Uh, going back, I'm glad we didn't rush it and it, it worked It worked just fine. But once we figured it out, I was like, oh, that's pretty dang clear. How we translate it into the better work method, again, took another couple of years. Uh, and that was a cross-functional committee that I, I wasn't on. Their job was to figure out how do we take what we know today, which is really learn, practice, and perform, and encapsulate the other parts that aren't uh, part of learn, practice, and perform, which we end up realizing were assess, plan, and build. They came, they went into a room, they did sprints, they did two-hour meetings, you know, day over day. And I think when you do that, you kind of want those meetings to end, so you really focus on them <laughs> during those times. But they came out of there, and sh- and uh, and when I got the first presentation on it with my colleagues, I was like, oh yes, I was just so appreciative. Like I had just loved that. It, they did it. And now we're building the whole company uh, value prop around it. And when we think about acquisitions, when we think about partnerships, it all can be seen through the lens of where are we strongest in the better work method? You know, wh- what takes the most manual effort and what, what is the most automated and beautiful? And how do we make more of it automated and beautiful and less of it take effort? And who can we partner with who does maybe the assess part really well right now? Or who does the plan part really well right now? You know, Trello is really great for planning. People use it for planning all the same time. Right. Uh, I'm not saying that's the, the place we're going to partner, but that's but that's the lens we can now view it through because we have the clarity of the better work method. Right. How successful do you think you've been taking? So I feel like you said uh, about a year ago, right? That became really crisp. Yeah, in the right. past year. Yep. Yeah. How, if at all, has that permeated from a product perspective? how you guys think about what features you need to build, how you prioritize them, like outside of maybe the leadership team. When, sure. If I'm sitting in a sprint planning session here at Lessonly, what does that actually look like? Is, yeah, does great it come question. up? Yeah, that, there's teams for each one of them. So Andrew Robinson. Oh, right on. Yeah, Andrew. And some of those people, some people on a, the assess team are also on the learn team. So it's not like, you know, they have to be mutually exclusive people. Andrew Robinson uh, is, is leading our product efforts. He's done an excellent job coming in and, uh, you know, stopping the waterfall nature of of our work uh, that had come kind of come before that, where we didn't do small sprints and find value and experiment. We kind of just guessed and then we marched toward guess, uh, and that can be debilitating and not very exciting. So yeah. he's done an excellent job breaking it, uh, breaking the teams out, and we have a we have a team for every one of those, and then we have a, uh, really an ops team that is the fundamental scale. You know, scale security that that team yeah. where that that it doesn't fit perfectly in the better work method, but it matters. Yes. Uh, uh, so we have, you know, seven uh, distinct teams and uh, that, so they come up all the time when the learn team has something they're working on. We know why they're working on it because it's part of the learn step and the better work method. Interesting. What's the process? If, if you know the details behind this, what's the process for managing those priorities across teams so that all seven of them are aligned on a specific feature or set of features that might be going out that might touch a, a handful yeah, of Yeah, no, different it's a great question. It, yeah, cross collaboration and those teams don't have to, if you were on the learn team this quarter, you don't have to be on the learn team next quarter. If that maybe there's a, a big tie between assess and learn this quarter, maybe we want to have similar people on those teams tackling those those two different projects. It's not, by no means is it like, hey, we've uh, dialed it in. It's a lot of communication. Yeah. Uh, Andrew does a nice job of doing show and tell on a weekly basis and biweekly basis. Uh, so people stay aligned on here's what we're doing, here's what we're thinking. And we're, 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 we're a small, big team, you know, like 30, 30 people on the product team, give or take. There's good communication right now. We need to keep it that way. But yeah, you're right. There, you know, that ops team is constantly communicating with every one of those parts because they need to make some structural changes to the API, you know, that right. are going to be required. But then there's, you know, it's also important to remember that. Uh, it, or to, to know that in a certain quarter, we're not doing equal amounts of effort in all those in all of those parts. We might do a lot in assess this quarter, and because that's really how we think about it, is quarterly, every ninety days. 
We might do a lot in assess this quarter and less in assess next quarter in order to have more resources in practice. Uh, you know, those are just two different parts of the better work method. We don't need to give them all equal weight every quarter because some of them need more attention than others. And some of them, we have more ambition in certain, at certain times in a certain part of the better work method than another. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So that can help as well. All right. I'm going to switch gears. We only have a couple more minutes. I want to be respectful of your time. I'm going to switch gears to maybe. I'm loving this. You guys as long as you want. Yeah. Yeah. I am. I like it. All right. So. I'm going to, I want you to think of your top five competitors, the, the, the people you think of as direct competitors to Lesson Fleet. Yep. Lesson Fleet. You don't have to say who they are. Sure. Do you have any formal structure to how you stay current on what those folks are doing? Do you like Google alerts, like anything you do on a regular basis to keep a diet of what the competition is doing? I personally don't have any formal structure, don't have Google alerts, don't go to their websites, uh, but we have, you know, I think it, Everybody is different. So enough people on the team who are interested in that do go to the websites, do share. If there's a big move in the company, I'm not going to be shy about saying that was a good idea that that company just, you know, that was a good move that company just made or, hey, I'm intimidated by that too. I run on the thesis that your competitors should be good. And if they're not good, you're playing in the wrong league. Uh, you right. know, you, you don't, NBA players don't go play rec league so they can win all the time. They go play with other NBA players because they want to compete and you know the rec league doesn't pay as well but you get the idea you get the idea <laughs> yes. it's not very fun to just just trounce everybody right you want your competitors to be good they keep you sharp they'll teach you things it, it implies that you're in the league that you want to be and if your competitors aren't good i'd be nervous so i, I don't want people to have reality distortion uh, glasses on that says our competitors can never do a smart thing because that's very that's very silly and what will end up happening is that will inhibit communication in the organization if somebody sees a competitor do a good thing and they don't feel like they can say that was a good thing because right. our posture is the competitors never do good things. And I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but I've seen companies take that posture of the competition always sucks. Oh, yeah. And I find that to be a great way to make people feel really bad when they lose a deal to the competition when that's going to happen. So do we really want people walking out there feeling even worse for losing that deal when hey, our competitors are good? We're going to lose some deals. And also, we don't want it. I don't want to do anything that restricts communication and that. If I put up the posture that competitors think we're going to restrict communication, people aren't going to tell us something we should know. It's interesting. Your your answer took me down a path mentally. One, it got me thinking about the hard thing about hard things. Have you ever read that book? I have. I actually just talked about it this week with a friend. It's been a couple of years, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And so while you were talking about competition, how we react to our competition, it led me. It made me think about where Horowitz was talking about um uh, peacetime CEO, wartime CEO, some of the differences between them. Right? Yeah, I remember so, him like, talking about that. I remember the wartime, said, no. yeah. the wartime CEO is very much, fo- you know, like you're at war, right? So you're thinking that, like, and I think there were some very similar things in there that you can't assume. You're not at war if all your competition sucks, right? Like right. You, you have to have good competition to be considered to be at war. If if all your competition was crappy, you'd be a peacetime CEO, right? right. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, while you were talking about that, it was taking me back to that book. I haven't read it in years. I probably need to dust it off. But that's a memory though led me down the path of thinking, are you in a crazy competitive market? Like are, when you think of going out and selling, do you, are you walking into the room and like you're part of a, when Lessonly shows up, but you're, you're selling against five other competitors who are all there at the same time, all trying to get in the door at this customer or prospect? Or when you show up, is it like nobody else is there and we're not like the market is big enough and there's so few customers who are paying companies like us today that like, we can just sell. And if we encounter somebody where the competition got there before, it's not a big deal. It's still, you know, it's still wide open market. We, yeah. can, we can keep going. Where, where are you at from a market perspective? So there's a ton of greenfield in our space. And when I say greenfield, I mean, first time buyers, sales teams, customer service teams traditionally have not had what we do and they want it. And what, especially once we come to them and say, Hey, look what we can do. They're like, Oh, I didn't know that existed. That's great. As they start to spend more. So let's say somebody comes through and spends 15 grand with us and we're the first one to meet them. They probably won't go do a lot of shopping. They probably won't go and do a lot of checks. It kind of depends on their culture and their yeah. organization, uh, how that 15 grand is going to feel. As you start to make that 15 grand, 150 grand, which that's what we do a lot more of now. <laughs> yeah. You don't have people go, yeah, we'll just take you take on your word that you're, you're the best for our needs. They go shop. So right. as the dollar value goes up, the, comp- the competition goes up. We have plenty of competition. Uh, we have good competition, but there's a lot of opportunity out there. So as we uh, win one deal or lose the next, the world is very, very big. We're not all chomping at the exact same things. Uh, so you can win one, I can win one, and we can all make real big businesses. 
And I'm not sure if that'll always be the case, uh, you know, because there's not always going to be greenfield, I would imagine. I'd imagine this is going to be commoditized like any other healthy market becomes, it becomes commoditized. But I don't think we're anywhere near there right now. Awesome. That's a, that's a great place to be. We experienced that on uh, Tenant Tracker, uh, yeah. which is our commercial real estate product. And in a lot of cases, that you know, we're the first solution in the space outside of an Excel spreadsheet that a customer is looking at. Sure. And when we look at, you know, when we do show up somewhere and there's, you know, they're competitively shopping the product or something like that, it's, you know, it happens so rarely that there's somebody else that they're looking at that, you know, we're pretty confident we can win. So it's just, uh, it is nice when you have that versus a space where, you know, every deal that you look at, there's, you know, there's actively somebody else selling against you. You bet. Yeah. We get, we get a little bit of both. And I'll just add one thing. There's pros and cons to both. You know, you, I think that's always the case with anything. I think that, you know, our salespeople would probably go, it'd be nice if we weren't always evangelizing, you know, like there's a lot of evangelizing in a, in a sale where you're a party of one, because there's a reason you're a party of one. You're right. there before everybody else in that, in that case. And so you get to educate the customer. Yeah. 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 And then the, the, to not be a party of one means there's probably more price pressure. You know, the people know what they want. So they're shopping around and they know who they can get it from. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. I would always prefer to evangelize, but that's just my, that's my style. Right on. Uh, that resonates with me as well. But I don't know if you know, we have a PEO. I did not know that. That uh, we run and I've been learning a lot about PEOs uh, over sure. the last sure. uh, year. And uh, it's interesting. I went to, so there's a national organization for PEOs that where they talk about at the last conference, they were talking about a study that they did. And I'm going to butcher these numbers a little bit, but in general, this is true that something like, you know, two, two thirds of the companies that are like dead on target for a PEO where a PEO makes like tons of sense, right? They, they should, if maybe they shouldn't necessarily be using a PEO, but they should be looking at it yep. as an option. And for our first time listeners, what's a PEO? Uh, professional employment organization, think HR consulting company. They're going to come in and help you with payroll benefits, 401k, everything. All back need, office. All back office. Yep. Everything you need to take care of your people. Great. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. That's probably good. A distinction, you know, basically their study showed that like so two thirds of the companies in the market that could use a PEO and where it's like a slam dunk, it's you know something they should consider are not using a PEO. So only one third of the available market is using a PEO. And then, to be. and then they went and looked at who PEOs are selling to, and almost every marketing strategy and sales strategy for the PEOs that they surveyed was we go because we don't want to evangelize, mm-hmm. we go poach the customers of the other PEOs yep. in our markets. Yep. So when we go and look to who we're going to sell to, we, we say, who's using a PEO today? If they're not using us, we're going to go undercut our competitor by 10%, okay. right? And just take them on price. And I look at that and I'm like, that's insanity. Mm-hmm. Like it's insanity for a number of reasons, right? Like how you get them is how you're going to have them, right? So if they'll leave one PEO for a 5% difference, guess how long you're going to have them, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Like, so that's that's number one. And number two, like I look at the two thirds of the market that's wide open. And it's like, put me in. Like, you know, I'm out to your point. I'd gladly evangelize. I'd be happy to educate them on why we're better and the distinctions and the, the the things that we've tried to specialize in and set ourselves apart in, why they matter and, you know, why it's going to be a different experience. And yeah. like, you know, the ability to do that, you basically get to set the stage so that when the next person shows up to try to poach them, they're drinking your Kool Aid, right? Yeah. Like you know, they and you they, believe in that Kool Aid. I believe in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like I, you know, it's it's not a script. It's something that we actually believe in, yep. and, and that's why we're making those investments. To your, to your point, that's why we're making those investments. Like anyway, it's just uh, like that resonates with me a lot, and I I don't I think that that is uncommon. I think most people would prefer not to do the education based sale to not yep. do the evangelism, and would much rather go where somebody understands the product, they understand the pain and they can just walk in and get a deal done. Yeah. And I think that probably has a lot to do with having, you can more naturally see, uh, I, I can more naturally picture, had ne- like, let's say I never had any experience evangelizing. I can picture how it's going to work in one of those worlds and not in the other. I can picture how it's going to work going to sell somebody who's already bought the thing. Yeah. It's a lot harder to visualize and see through kind of the, 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 the challenges to the finish line of how much better it is once you do that hard work. Uh, when you when you convince somebody that the new thing really matters, and they go, "You're so right, the new thing really matters." It, that's a story that I don't think if you haven't if you haven't experienced it, it's tough to imagine. And you're probably going to stop at the point of it's going to be more effort up front, uh, and maybe it isn't going to be more effort up front. But I don't know if that makes sense. I just think people that's a harder story to tell, and it's also what's insanity to you to somebody else looks like smart uh, lack of risk taking, uh, you know, uh, low risk, right? 
And, and, it, and, I'm sure and, it is. and they're looking at you like that guy's insane, you know? And that's the cool thing about the world is people are wired differently. And one man's insanity is another person's uh, joy. How do you do, if you're willing to talk about this, how do you guys do evangelization, uh, evangelization with your customers? What's, what's the process you walk through when you're trying to educate a customer on what you guys do? Yeah. Uh, our chief sales officer, Justin fight has a really neat, he had made a really neat observation early on that has really stuck, which is people don't buy training. They, they, they buy a solution to their problems. So you don't sell them training. You find their problems and you say, well, if we wrap training around that problem, it's going to get resolved a lot quicker. You find their opportunities, we have training around that opportunity, it's going to get there faster and you don't sell training. So it starts out with what are, you, what are you working on? What keeps you up at night? What excites you about the future? And what is the limiting factor to you getting there? Training's probably going to help because you, once you, what, what you want probably depends on a bunch of people being coordinated in, in their efforts and training's all about coordination. So that's how you start the evangelization is you, just like anything, you tie it to the, the thing the person already knows and, uh, that's where that's where the journey has to start, right? What is the story they're already telling themselves and how do we insert ourselves into that story to make them see that it will be better, a better story if they'd come with us or if they let us along for the ride. Right. Is that what you were looking for? Yeah, solid, man. I'm parsing your, uh, your answer. That's great. Uh, okay, so I suck at interviewing. Let's go back to the rapid fire questions. Because I'm, <laughs> oh, because we stopped doing that? I'm that's just okay. following the that's thread. Okay. Yeah, been sorry. Awesome. I need, to, I need to get better at this whole podcasting thing. So... Do you guys uh, leverage any third-party tools or data sources for market analysis and what the industry is doing? Like, is Justin subscribed to any data feeds or anything like that where he gets regular updates or whoever in the organization that you know of? Do you guys do any of that? I'm aware that that happens. I am not uh, informed enough to speak to it with any degree of authority. And I would be nervous about saying somebody was doing something that they weren't doing. No worries. Do you do any, I think the, I know the answer to this, but do you do any general market evangelization outside of the sales cycle? Are you speaking at conferences or, or it, and you more in the lesson lead, less about you, Max, but do you, how much, how active are you guys in the broader industry in terms of like, this is the pain that we're solving. This is, this, these are our strong opinions in the space. Yeah. How much of that do you guys do? Uh, that's a big part of the business. I mean, I think that's our our moral obligation to all of our teammates is to do that well uh, from a marketing uh, standpoint and just from a just uh, education standpoint. While I would love everybody to be using Lessonly, I do really get excited when we convince somebody to do better training for their people, you know, just to take it seriously. The training has such baggage. You think about a basketball player or a just an athlete. Training is what they do. Right, right. that's how they perform. Uh, it is seen as a means to high performance and, and great personal improvement. But in the working world, training has been about compliance and keeping protecting the company from the people. So we have to change the narrative and that requires a lot of conversation. And if we change the narrative, it's going to ultimately benefit us. But if every piece of it doesn't benefit us, people are going to do better work anyway. And we, I want people to do better work. It's fun when people feel fulfilled. It's fun when people are competent and it's not fun when people are stressed. That's fewer people I have to go to dinner with who are who are complaining about their jobs. Uh, that's fewer people who I have around me who are not being served in the way that they should be served. Companies hire people and they want them to do good work. People join companies wanting to do good work. So what's broken about the equation? Well, the company doesn't do its part to teach people what good work looks like. And why would they assume that those people are just going to magically come up with the formula for good work when they just walked in the door? But a lot of it is assumed. Well, you should just be able to figure it out. It'd be yes, Mr. and Mrs. Employer. It'd be really helpful though if you if you told me a little bit. I'm not telling you. I'm not telling companies they have to have the playbook for every permutation. I'm telling them to start one percent at a time, being more explicit about what good work looks like, and a lot of good things will happen. Yeah. How do you guys decide where you're going to spend that time? Whether it's conferences or places that you can tell the story and do evangelization. It really goes back to those, uh, you know, uh, client profiles of, of the sales teams, the customer so services. Where are, where are the they? customers? Yeah, where are they? And where is the noise around those customers? Where is it the noisiest? And let's not go there. I like to think about it. If somebody's playing a game, if there's a lot of people playing the same game, that's not the game I want to play. Uh, so if we look at a roster of every competitor at a specific conference, I think the natural instinct is, well, we should be there too. And I could probably argue that there's a lot of wisdom in that. But I could also argue that that's the last place we want to be because not every one of our customers is there. And where's the place where we can really stand out where we can really shine where we don't have to compete for 3% of somebody's attention, where we can have the whole thing where we can set up a dinner across the street from that conference where we invite those people who are getting percentage of their time taken by everybody during the day. And at night 
We get to sit down with them and laugh and eat uh, and have some great drinks and have a blast and get their full attention. That's what I want to do. I don't want to be at a booth. I want to be at a dinner. Yeah. It Was it Erickson who wrote the was one of the guys who co-authored the human behavior thing who came up with the concept of 10,000 hours and all that. Is that, am I getting that right? I'm not sure who came up with that. Um, I know Gladwell popularized it, but it, I think it's like Kenrick Erickson or something like that. I'll have to cool name. re-research that. So he talked about in those original papers and that original research, he talked about the concept of like purposeful practice, right? So like sure. you can't go back to your sports analogy. If you're playing basketball, it's, Less effective. So if if all you could do was go to the basketball court every day and play a game, that'd be great. Yep. And you would probably get better over time, but yep. you would you would hit a point of diminishing returns where just playing games will you'll you'll stop seeing this uh determinant shift yep. in, in performance. Versus if you're doing purposeful practice where you're examining your performance and where it's at right now today, and you look at where you're deficient, and then you spend you know, two hours a day for three weeks, just practicing free throws yep. or just running. So you're not as winded or, just, you know, whatever it is, right? Like wherever you're most efficient at that time. And then you specifically design exercises to get better at that thing. Yep. And then you're also playing some pickup games and stuff like that every now and then. And then that's where athletes just, you know, you, you see them make huge leaps and jumps. Sure. All of that. Like, so, so taking this back to training, when I think of, putting in reps and in getting really good at something, is there anything that you guys either bake into Lessonly or as part of your customer onboarding for when a, 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 a new trainer mm-hmm. or you set of users join Lessonly that help them understand how to design lessons better so that, that, you know, baking in this idea of like purposeful practice versus yeah. just, you know, putting content out there and just yeah. hoping that if people watch that content 15 times, they're going to get better. Sure. They're probably not. How do you guys either bake that into the product or bake that into your onboarding experience so that you can ensure that the the experience of Lessonly is as good as you want it to be? Yeah, great question. So we first and foremost, we zero in on where do most training programs fall on their faces? Where do they get their shoes tied together and then fall down? And that's usually at the build stage. So they identify the need that needs to be addressed with training, and then they stay in a vacuum building the content that's supposed to address that training need for weeks or months at a time. And by the time it's done, it has been only sanity checked by the by the ad- administrators, the administrators, not by the people who ultimately need it. Right. It, it probably wasn't co-created with those individuals, and it's probably six months too late or six weeks too late, uh, or if it's not too late, uh, it's definitely been too long. So what we do is we call it share before you're ready. It's actually a lessonly value and it transcends training, which is this idea of don't wait until you feel it's perfect. Don't wait until it's cast in bronze to find out that the arm placement isn't where it needs to be because the bronze casting is far too late. So what we recommend is create an outline, create a rough draft, take an hour on that first rough draft of your lesson. Identify five people on the team who are going to ultimately need to take that training. Let them know that you're sharing before you're ready. Find two or three of them who are newbies to the team. Find two or three of them who are veterans and say, what am I missing here? I'm going to go whole hog on this. If you tell me I'm missing something, I need to know what I'm missing. And then repeat. Once you get that feedback, go back again, go back again. Maybe tap different people each time, but find the people who don't just tell you it looks great. You know, like, right. Maybe it does look great, but if you're constantly getting, it looks great from the same person, find somebody else. Cause what you need to know is where it doesn't look great and where it does look great. So you can do more of it. So what, like, what we like to think about is what are the problems that I can solve, but also what's working and understanding what's working is only way you understand what to do more of. So you have to ask both things. What's working? What is it? Uh, and that iteration cycle, is just agile. You know, it's just really just an agile approach, which just rapid iteration. And that is something that people are genuinely uncomfortable with because they want to do really good work. And the fear of looking silly or looking like you don't know is a great, great fear. Shame is a very, very powerful motivator. Yeah. And to feel shame that I'm supposed to be creating the training on this and I don't know exactly how it's supposed to look is something that robs a lot of value from the from the learner if we don't get past it. Because you shouldn't feel shame that you don't know exactly how it's supposed to look. You should feel that this is a co-creation. You might be the owner of it, but you need to know what the team needs in order to truly deliver on that. So don't stay in a vacuum. Get out of the vacuum and keep getting out of the vacuum. In a vacuum, you have one person's brain to do the job. And we don't see ourselves very well. We don't see reality very well. We need other people to reality test. Uh, so get out of the vacuum. 
And uh, then the practice part is the other one. So share before you're ready, a really important part of building better training programs, but also just the practice on top of the learning. A lot of what traditional training software does is it does learning and then expects performance to come. And what we've learned uh, over time is that practice component in, in the middle, learning and then practicing, it's how you start locking stuff in. Uh, you learn something, then you apply it and you get feedback and you get to apply it again and you get to apply it again. You time delay the learning and the practicing. You learn something today, three days later, you're asked in your own words, what's important about this thing? That's a practice that's mentally bringing the information back to the forefront of your brain and retrieving it. Uh, or three days later or two days later, you say, tell me how you'd respond to X, Y, or Z question. And you learned it two or three days ago. And it's like, oh, I got to retrieve that. And I got I to gotta perform, you know, I got to like, put yeah. me on, I'm on a stage, but what we find is people don't love being uh, on a stage in the practice session, but they do love the results. And once they see the results later, they're, they're doing it live in front of a customer and they're much, they're very happy. They practiced and they were, they put them, made themselves a little uncomfortable in their practice session because they got to nail it in front of the customer. Uh, so we actually, we, it was a really cool survey. Um, a few different customers uh, sent, did this on their own. Like, did you enjoy the process of practicing? No. Did you enjoy the results? Oh Yeah. Because uh, uh, this is not fun to practice, you know. It's like nobody likes to go to the gym, but we all like to look good, you know. Like right. we all like to be physically fit, and I'm not saying you have to be physically fit to look good, but I'm saying a lot of people like to feel Correct. physically fit and look physically fit. But very few people are like, I want to go for a walk, or I want to go for a run, or I want to lift some weights, right? Uh, and that I don't think is any different when it comes to practicing. But you really do like the results, and the results are the contagious part. All right, I'm gonna move towards wrapping things up. So this next question has nothing to do with Lessonly. Uh, this is just about you. What are you jazzed about right now? What are you learning that has you excited uh, that you can't wait to learn more of? I really like that question uh, because I just love talking about stuff that I'm learning. I, really, I do. I just think it's I think it's so cool. So Steven Pinker recently wrote a book uh, called Enlightenment Now. And the whole idea of Enlightenment Now is really rooted in this idea of uh, we have a negativity bias. So we not only have a, so there's two things that this book is rooted in. Basically, I'll get to what the book's about and then I'll tell you kind of where it comes from. The book is that over the past 200 years, since the age of the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment's all about science. It's all about striving to be more rational because we're naturally irrational. So making more of an effort to, to be more thoughtful and more empirical. And then humanism, putting the human at the center uh, of value. Groups don't feel pain, humans do. So we should protect humans. You know, it's like what we're rooted in in, yeah. in America, you know, liberty, uh, and individuality. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be more cooperative, but it does mean we should protect humans. Uh, in the absence of humanism, you have you have religion, and religion has classically sacrificed individuals for the greater good of right. some deity, and we've never met that deity, and it seems like we should protect the people that we know, not something that we've never seen. So humanism is all about protect the things that we know and that we see have beating hearts and feelings. This book's all about, over the since the start of the Enlightenment uh, era, We've made a ton of progress, but people don't seem to know about it. And there's a couple reasons they don't know about it. When I say progress, I mean we're living longer. We're dramatically safer. Yeah, yeah. We're dramatically less violent. Uh, we are, we're actually more ecological, even if we have this big climate change looming. And he argues that we need to take care of that. Uh, there's two things he argues that can really set us back from all this progress, and that's nuclear war, climate change. We have to do something about them. But – we will only be inspired to do something about them if we understand how much progress we've made. If we think that progress has only doomed us, well, why would we want to keep progressing? Right. He talks about progress phobia, where we have this phobia that we only see the negative parts of progress. And he says there's two reasons this happens. The availability heuristic, which is this idea, if I have 10 examples of one thing and two examples of another, I think that the thing I have 10 examples of happens more often. The reality is I've just experienced that 10 more times, five more times than I have the other thing. But that doesn't mean it happens more often. It just means that I might have seen it more often. Right. It doesn't actually have any reality, just what I've seen. But our brains don't think like that. They think we have 10 examples of one thing, two examples of another. The 10 things must happen more than the two things. An example of that is if I have a lot of news articles that talk about how violence across the world, and I only have a couple of news articles that talk about peace across the world, I think the world's really violent. Right. And the reality is data doesn't prove that out. The world is increasingly less violent, even if we have these blips of terrorism that are no, they're, they're tragic, but a lot more people are living than, 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 uh, than used to die. Correct. And that's per capita. So I love that because I have a tough time getting excited about the future if I think it's bleak and grim. And I think uh, I have thought it was bleak and grim. And this guy has helped me see that that's my availability. I have a lot of bleak and grim examples. The news doesn't 
stay on stay the news by showing us good stuff. Correct. We don't come back to it if we don't think we have something to worry about. Fear is a powerful motivator. And I don't think anybody's doing this on purpose. And I don't think anybody is necessarily doing anything wrong. I think we have to take the responsibility of ourselves to seek out different perspectives and to not be so influenced by anecdotal evidence. And then, you know, the second thing is negativity bias. You ever heard of the sandwich of I'm going to give you one compliment and then I'm going to give you something to work on. It has a specific descriptor to it. Yes. I've heard of that sandwich. Yeah. That sandwich. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, what do they call it? Is it a uh, curse word or something? Uh, it's okay, the, cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the reason that people, I think that it turns out that doesn't really feel good still is we weight negative sentiment three times more heavily than we rate positive sentiment. So if I give you three things of equal kind of urgency or, or, I guess, implication, you're going to feel the negative thing three times more than you're going to feel the positive thing. And that's just our, you know, I think we want to stay alive. I think we're wired to stay alive and we're wired to seek out, to identify threats and we're wired to identify and things that don't feel good. We tend to fester on and the things that feel good, we tend to lose fast. You know, like I give you a compliment and you're like, you forget it in an instant. Uh, I give you a criticism. You might carry that with you for seven uh, days or seven years. It's just the way we're wired. Right. So with those two things, availability and our negativity bias, we have this warped perception of how well things are going. does not mean we should not seek to understand what isn't going well so we can make it better. But Pete Pinker argues we should seek to understand what is going well so we can do more of it. And that approach is called appreciative inquiry. You can make things, you can improve the world by finding problems and solving them, but you can also improve the world by pointing out what's working so we can do more of it. If people know what's working, then they have a model for what to do themselves. Just like I told you earlier, you got to tell people what good looks like if you want them to do it. Yeah. If we're only talking about what isn't working, we tend to think nothing's working. And so we need a good balance of what is working so we can uh, have that cognitive load be lessened. Uh, if you, it's really what you focus on becomes your reality. If you're only focusing on what isn't working, then it looks like everything isn't working. Even if only 20% of things aren't working, you miss the whole 80% of things that are working. Uh, and I'm, I am so enamored by this because when you talk about what's working, people get clarity. And, uh, when you talk about what isn't working, they get clarity in what isn't working, but what do you want to have clarity on what to do? Not what not to do, right? Tell people what to do. Don't tell them what not to do. And I want to, I want people to just live less stressed lives. And I think that perspective of let's focus more on what's working is not a Pollyanna. It's not irrational. It's really just about showing people what good looks like and showing people that uh, things are worth fighting for because we are on the whole doing a lot of things way better. You and I get to live a lot longer. Uh, We get to eat better, richer food, more plentiful food. We get to feed more people. A lot of good things are happening. So that's been on my mind. Dude, that's awesome. All right. If people would like to learn more about Lessonly or connect with you online, where can they do those things? Thanks for asking. So Lessonly.com, L-E-S-S-O-N-L-Y.com. Uh, and then uh, Lessonly on Twitter as well. Uh, and Lesson.ly uh, on Instagram. We used to have a dot .ly, uh, but then we bought the dot .com. And then um, I'm Max Yoder. So it's M-A-X-Y-O-D-E-R. And uh, that's on Twitter. And uh, they can email me at max at lessonly.com as well. Thanks for asking. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming this on. This was great. I'm, I'm pumped that you asked me. And, and thanks for letting me do it. If you're thinking of launching a SaaS product, startup competitors can provide data on your closest competitors, survey potential users, or provide other product validation services. Learn more at startupcompetitors.com.